but I was looking for events for me and the T2 team to go to, and I wanted us to be developed, because if we're going to be good at our jobs, we've got to stay ahead of the game. So I was looking at all sorts. What, what could we go on that could immerse ourselves in development and challenge us to the max? And all I got was conference, 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 a lot of speakers, you go to events, you drink loads of coffee, you play with your phone, you go out, the exhibitor lounges outside, and basically you just get drunk on an evening. That's the usual conference sort of routine. And I don't think you learn a lot from that. And I really don't. I, I'm very anti-conference. So I started to look for stuff, and there was literally nothing out there, nothing that was intimate, that was kinesthetic, that was hands-on, that challenged you just enough without making you feel too uncomfortable, and that spread around the activities from workshops to challenges to speakers to dinner, and I thought, let's create one. So the T2 Leadership Retreat was born in my head, and I thought this idea of bringing 40 to 50 people together over a three-day period and for an immersive experience, I thought that's got to be something that, that you will take away and remember for the rest of your life. So we spent six months trying to plan it. Me and Lydia visited the Grove six months ago, and we decided this is where we're going to do it. So you're going to be in for, a, hopefully, a three days, which is different to anything you have experienced before. And what I'd like to say is if you come with us and bear with us, you will get as much value from this personal life, professional life, but you will take some reflections away, and you'll be better and more rounded for it. So throw yourselves in. Be brave. Be bold. Be open and vulnerable. This afternoon, you're going to hear all about yourself. There'll be things you want to chuck away. Just sit, sit in the moment and embrace it. Consultants are there to talk you through it. And I'm sure we're going to be in for a great day, three days. Please feed it back to us as we go through it. All right? So what I'm going to talk about this morning is an opener on leadership. There's many different terminologies with, le with, with leadership and what leadership is to different people. But I think leadership is a privilege. Don't you think? I think you're not necessarily revered or admired on your own merit. You're just not. You don't get to decide. You just don't. You've merely been given the opportunity to become so. Other people will decide if you're a good leader. Part of the reason we're doing the psychometrics this morning is because of this. But I want that quote to sit with you because it sits with me. And it sits with me because not only do I think that it absolutely describes what leadership is, but it also epitomizes the two greatest leaders that I have ever worked for. So all I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to tell you a story of two people. Two people who 20 years ago impacted my life for the better and who, ha who I hold in high regard and, and who I think I revered and admired. The first person I'm going to talk about is Maite Royal. She is a Spanish lady from the heart of Madrid. I joined Gartner, a global consulting business, at a young age. At this time, I was very fixed mindset. I was very alpha wolfishness. I thought I knew best. I wasn't very open to feedback. And I was probably bulldozing my way through my career, doing OK, but a few casualties along the way. I worked for MITRE, and I initially thought, this is going to be easy. She's a nice-natured woman. She's amiable. I can just do what I want. I'll never really be told. And um, my first ever meeting with MITRE, she sat me down. And the first day, she started asking me some very strange questions. Right. The first question she said to me, she said, Martin, if you achieved something amazing whilst you was here at Gartner, if you did something unbelievable, who would be the first person you would want to find out or to, to be recognized from? And I told her the answer. A bit strange, but I told her the answer. It all felt very human and very close and intrusive, but I went with it. And my first thoughts on Mitre was, this is different, but I like it. There's something about it that's disarming me, and that's bringing me around to a new way of thinking. Maita was wonderful at the amiable, collaborative, humanistic side of leadership. The other thing she did is in the second team meeting, this Vamos Conquistadors was the name that she developed for the team. She was a passionate Spaniard from the heart of Madrid, and she told the story of the Conquistadors. The Conquistadors in the 16th century was explorer soldiers. And they, I didn't know this, but they actually were responsible for traveling the world by sea, exploring, landing in different countries, and setting up trade routes with the world. They are the fundamental reason we have trade routes in the world, the conquistadors. Conquistador in Spanish is conqueror. So she told this story, and she said, so you see, team, we are the conquistadors. We are going to go out to our customers, our suppliers, our teams, and we are going to build trade routes. We're going to build allies. We're going to build relationships because we can't build out doors our way to success. We need everybody around us. And I remember sat at the back of the room. She'd already disarmed me in the first one-to-one, -one, thinking, I'm behind you. I'm on board. I'm a conquistador. 
And we had every team meeting, and she'd finished the meeting with vamos. Vamos means let's go. Vamos conquistador. And it was something that just rallied you, rallied me. So Maita had this way of bringing alive an identity for the team, giving us a passion, a purpose, getting us all behind it. And the final thing Maita taught me was the art of emotional detachment. Although she did an amazing job in turning me from this bulldozing alpha wolfish sort of personality into a quite a reflective developing personality, she had an uncanny way. I'd still come in with my chimp out and I'd still say, mate, and I remember one Christmas, I was trying to get to win a circle. It was in sales. I needed one more sale to get a five-star holiday for me and my wife to Sydney. I needed one deal. And uh, this guy had promised me a deal from a customer and it'd get me over the line. And it wasn't coming in and I had two days to Christmas Eve. And if I didn't get the deal in, I wasn't going to make Winner's Circle. So I'm getting erratic. Five emails a day, leaving voicemails. I'm nearly on his doorstep, knocking on his door. Because I need this deal. Mitre says, come in. I came in, I said, he's promised me this deal. I said, he's going to cost me my Winner's Circle. And I'm getting all irate and all emotional. I said, it's fucking this. And honestly, I'm getting... She said, Martin, sit down. I sat down. She said... If I replayed this situation back to you and someone else came to you with the same problem, what advice would you give to them? I said, that's not helping me, Maita. I said, I, need the an- I don't know the answers. I need you to give me an answer. How do I get this deal over the line? She said, no, stay with it. If someone else came to you with this problem and you described exactly what you described to me, what advice would you give to them? And I sort of paused for a second and I thought about the answer I would give. And I said, well... I'd probably say something's wrong with the deal. It's not going to happen in the next two days. You're now stalking him, and you're going to piss him off and cost us the deal. Back off. It ain't going to happen. And she said to me, and there's your answer. And in a heartbeat, Maita taught me the art of emotional detachment. She taught me to elevate myself out of a situation when the emotion is high and look at it almost from a fly on the wall and ask myself the question, if someone else, if I was looking down on this, what advice would I give? And for the rest of my time, I use that technique when I'm under pressure in the moment and I need to see something with clarity and clearly. My Terrell was an amazing leader. I'm still in touch with her today. I hope she watches this video back when it gets posted. But she epitomized and she was the first person who was not characterized by directive, strong, you know, absolute like conviction as a usual leader would have. She was amiable, soft, she was incredibly emotionally intelligent, and she taught me some fundamentals about how we can go forward as a group and and perform. The second leader I'm going to talk about for a final 15 minutes before we wrap up and we get stuck into the day is possibly, and I still am in touch with him today, and I desperately tried to get him here, but he's out sudden himself in some foreign country. He's He's going to come and hopefully appear at the next Tito retreat. It's Captain Richard Farrington. He was my captain on HMS Nottingham in 2002. Captain Richard Farrington is a legend in the Royal Navy for probably the wrong reason, as I'm about to explain to you. But I hold him in such high regard for actually the truth around what he achieved that day. In 2002, we're on HMS Nottingham. We're about to set sail on a seven-month deployment to the Far East. It's going to be amazing. We've got loads of good trips planned. It's peacetime. We're going to teach the Singapore and Thai Navy how to do combat and warfare at sea. The rest of it is a jolly, so we can't wait. Um, Before this, we'd had a year of hell in dry dock and sea trials around the UK, English Channel, rough as hell, bad weather, it's horrible. Anybody who's done sea trials, I know there's a few military guys in the room, anyone who's done sea trials, they're not enjoyable. Captain Richard Farrington earned his stripes and built his credits over that time. He walked the decks. He came on uh, to the pub with us and had a beer. He joined the sports team and immersed himself with the ship's company. He built his relationships in the bad times and in the sea trials and whilst we was there. And he built up his credits. So we set sail to the Far East. It's an amazing trip. We're four months in. We arrive at Lord Howe Island. Lord Howe Island is an island in the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand. It's 500 miles from anywhere. It's a habitable island, as you can see. There is a small community on it. There's a mayor. And what a place to live. Can you imagine living there? It's a little bit in the sticks, like, but it's an amazing place to live. We anchor off on the right-hand side of this island for the day. It's glorious sunshine. We're fishing. We're having a barbecue on the flight deck. The captain goes off to meet the mayor. And the plan is at the evening, we'll set sail for New Zealand. All is going well until the, the weather changes rapidly in the middle of the Tasman Sea. Sea state comes in. It's the evening. The captain's still 
on the helicopter ashore. He phones into the navigating officer and says, you go ahead, we'll catch you up, and I'll land on the ship on the helicopter behind. But it's too rough to stay at anchor, so you've got to get ahead of the game. The navigating officer plots his, on the map, he plots his route, we're in the middle of the sea, get around the island, and there's nothing for miles, and he steams ahead 30 knots on our course to New Zealand. What he didn't do is put the big map over the little map, which, as we know in naval uh, you know, navigation, you have a small area and a big area. Now, on the little map, there is this, Wolf Rock. Wolf Rock is that little tiny white bit you can see at the bottom. It looks tiny and it looks innocuous, um, but Wolf Rock is the largest underwater rock in the world. At high tide, you cannot see it. At l- it's, it's six foot below the waterline. At low tide, it sticks out above the waterline, just like this. That's Wolf Rock. It was high tide that night, and it was sat six foot below the waterline. We didn't put our sonar on, sonar on, and we didn't quote the lower map. We hit that rock at 22 knots, which, as anybody knows, is a, an, a, an enormous speed for a warship. We flung across the ship, sparks, water coming in. It was bad. And meanwhile, Captain Richard Farrington, he's only just getting in the helicopter. He gets radio through a May day. We've just hit a rock. He's on the helicopter. He's coming back. Alarms are going off on the bridge. It's all going off. We're going to action stations. Captain Richard Farrington lands on, runs up to the bridge, and the first thing he does, the alarms are going off, everyone's running around. He says, stop, turn those alarms off. The navigating officer says, we can't turn the alarms off. He says, you can, I'm telling you, turn the alarms off. I need to think. The alarms get turned off. He pauses. He does nothing for 60 seconds. Nothing. He thinks. His first decision that evening was this. We need to get off this rock. We need to get off the rock because it's in the front of the ship. And if we continue with the sea state, it will break the spine of the ship and we will sink. We've got to get off the rock. But captain, if we come off the rock, we're going to flood even more. Get us off this rock. Full reverse back, it comes off the rock. Brilliant. Come off the rock, we stop, we, we stabilize it. Second problem. Second problem is the water comes into the front of the ship at a fast rate of knots. And the forward engine room looks like this within three minutes. That compartment is probably around about, I would say, 16 foot high, 18 foot high. That's almost at the top. We look in, we've got no option, we've lost it. Close all the hatches, we've lost two deck and below at the front. So we lose two deck and below. We start to list forward with the nose of the ship. We start to list forward and we start to go to nosedive at any point. Captain Richard Farrington makes his second decision under pressure. He says, We've got to purposely flood, counter flood the aft depart, uh, compartments. Because if we can flood the aft compartments, we should be able to do this and stabilize the ship from a weight perspective. So it sounds complete. We've got water coming in and we have to run to the aft and purposely flood the good part of the ship. You know, it was a, a completely alien. But he made the call. We flooded the aft part of the ship. We stabilized ourselves and we managed to buy ourselves some time to be able to pump as much water as we could out until we got rescued. By the way, a week prior to this, we're training the New Zealand Navy because we're the best in the world, how to be a good Navy. The New Zealand Navy are now coming to save us. <laughs> Most embarrassing thing of all time. So that's the forward engine room. We've lost it. He's made his second decision, flood aft. All this is going on whilst 250 men are running all over the place and trying to keep this alive. And that's the size of the hull that rips through the ship. That's what is open at this point, 18 foot by 12 foot at the front of the ship. Most damage a warship's ever sustained since the Falklands War. So we are battling like crazy, and we've, we're about one hour from the New Zealand Navy coming to save us. And we realize that the pressure of the water in the forward part of the ship is making the bulkhead in the after engine room buckle. So he says to me and four others, I'm barely 19 years old, he says to me, you need to go down there and shore up that wall because we, if that wall goes, we lose the, lose the after engine room. And if we lose the after engine room, we lose everything. Can you do that for me, he said. Can you do that for me? No problem, sir. We went down, we shored up the after engine room. We was even hammering our bedding into it so the water wasn't coming through. Anything we could use and do, it was completely you know, counterintuitive, but it was anything we could do to shore it up. But we managed to save it for about two hours. We got the pumps in, we got control of it, and the ship stabilized. The rest of it was the world finding out, the media kicked back, and we had to do it. Captain Richard Farrington, he was reprimanded for the whole thing. He was on the hook, he was court-martialed, he never served at sea again. 
He had desk job for the rest of his life because ultimately the book stops with him. He's the captain. Anybody who was on that ship knows his decision-making, his ability to think under pressure, his ability to be calm and make decisions and stand by them and get the whole team rallying around him because he'd built his credits in, in, the, in the bad times, drove high performance that night. And he's a hero to all of us. And I'm still in touch with him today. If you're interested in this, I've, written a, uh, I've done a podcast with him where he speaks quite passionately about, he calls it my boys. It was before women served at sea. It was in the days when it was still all male ships. He calls it my boys. It was about saving my boys. He's a fantastic man to listen to. And he's someone who I hold in high regard. He is revered. He is admired. And the decisions he took that night was maximum self-awareness, driving teamwork because he's built up his credits, and high performance under pressure. So, they're two stories of somebody or two people who I think epitomize leadership. My question to you all as we go on this journey for the next three days is this. Who are you, who's going to be talking about you in 20 years' time? Who's going to tell a story about the impact you had, no matter how small, on their life, their career, the moment of need? Because in the absence of that, have we shown great leadership? Have we actually truly made a difference? And it's about being self-aware. It's about being vulnerable. It's about understanding how teams work. And then collectively, it's about going forward and driving high performance together. So I think that we've got an amazing opportunity over the next three days to achieve this. I'm looking forward to spending every day with you. We're going to kick off after this. Tracy's going to come back on for five minutes in a minute. But just relax your shoulders. Embrace this morning. Self-awareness is not your strengths. That's strength awareness. Self-awareness is the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've done some testing on you, and you've opened yourself up, and we've got feedback in the terms of 360 psychometrics. You've got some amazing feedback, by the way, so let's make sure we embrace the good. We've got some amazing people in this room, but you've also got some opportunities to look at something and not flinch and not bat it away and say, yes, I can be like that. That's what self-awareness is. So let's have an amazing day. Let's throw ourselves into it, go through the morning, and then hopefully we'll, by lunch, we're absolutely motoring. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.